Hello and welcome. This is Business Incorporated on Channels Television. I'm Chimeze Obi Iwagu. On the show today, Zambia hints at first COVID default as African debt burden rises. A project aimed at developing Zimbabwe's biggest platinum mine clears a significant hurdle. Plus, we will be looking at the surprise rate cut by Nigeria's Monetary Policy Committee and what that means for investment. Let's get the show started now with intraday market numbers beginning here in Africa where the markets were all positive. South Africa's JC index jumped the most by 2.05%, while Nigeria's NSE rose 0.11%. In Egypt, the EGX30 index was higher by 0.46%. Kenya closed positive on Tuesday. And markets in the Middle East were mostly negative at intraday, except the market in Dubai, which was up 0.94% at intraday. The Abu Dhabi index declined 0.18%. Elsewhere in the region, Saudi Arabia's index shared 0.56%, while the Qatari index lost 0.55%. And European stocks climbed in the morning as investors reacted to key data releases from the Eurozone. For more, let's cross over now to Chelsea. Hello, Chelsea. Good afternoon. Well, new data out today shows the recovery in the Eurozone economy has already ground to a halt. What's behind the slowdown? Investors don't really seem to be heeding this today. As you mentioned, stocks are up quite a bit. But this data is, uh, it's a bit of a blow for the Eurozone recovery story. Um, basically, since uh, since June, uh, we, we have seen uh, economic activity in the Eurozone really pick up. And, and that's as lockdown measures were lifted and, and people really got back to, to everyday life, got back to work, got back to restaurants. But uh, last month, this month in particular, September, we, we have really seen uh, that uh, begin to reverse. Uh, across the, the Eurozone. So <clears throat> looking at the data that was released today, what we saw was really uh, a very, a very uh, surprising decline in service sector activity. So uh, that is, is likely due to people starting to shy away from restaurants, from stores, from traveling in particular. Um, and, and, and the declines we're seeing are, are uh, even steeper in, in countries like Spain and Italy that have uh, a lot of dependence on the tourism sector. So that's definitely playing a role in this slowdown we're seeing. And uh, that's also as we have started to see uh, certain coronavirus restrictions reintroduced across Europe. Um, the number of coronavirus cases has been surging in many countries, uh, in many areas. And that's forced a lot of governments to reimpose certain uh, certain measures, such as, um, you know, uh, limiting the number of people that you can uh, be in groups with or uh, shutting down uh, restaurants and bars and things like that. Uh, and this really just looks like the, the beginning of, uh, of new restrictions here in Europe. So for the economic outlook, that is all quite negative. Mm. And Facebook is in the news. Uh, the tech giant has threatened to pull out of Europe if regulators crack down on its data sharing practices. How real is this threat? So Facebook is, is saying that it's not a threat. It's just really the reality that they're facing. Um, Facebook has been embroiled in a, a, a regulatory battle here in Europe for, for several years over its practice of sharing data uh, with its U.S. business. So the data it collects from users here in Europe, it often transfers back to the United States. Uh, the company was sued for for these data transfers because um, a, lot of, a lot of people here in Europe, a lot of consumers, a lot of Facebook users were very concerned that they were being uh, basically watched by by U.S. surveillance. So um, that was one of the reasons why we, we saw uh, this court case come to a head last uh, over the summer. So in July, the European Court of Justice, the top court here in Europe, said that Facebook and other companies need to basically uh, be much more careful with, with how they're transferring data. Uh, and Facebook is saying that the, the rules that are being put in place basically will, will not allow them to operate here. So um, that, that's really the, the point that they're coming from. Experts say that they, they do have some options. They could, for example, um, basically hive off their, their European data and, and keep it here instead of transferring it back to the United States. They could shut down, but they have about 400 million users here in Europe. So uh, that's obviously a very big market. Um, but they likely will have to make some sort of change to the way that they handle user data here in Europe if they want to keep operating here.
An economist is warning that Germany could seek a wave of bankruptcies due to the coronavirus. Uh, who is most vulnerable here? So this has been an interesting theme throughout the, the coronavirus pandemic. Even as the economy here has really contracted, we haven't seen a wave of bankruptcies yet. Actually, we saw bankruptcies decline in the first half of the year, almost 10 percent. And that's because Germany basically suspended the, the rules uh, around how fast people and companies have to apply for bankruptcy once they start running into financial trouble. So they wanted to give companies a little more breathing room um, to have some space if they are experiencing COVID-related financial difficulties to sort of sort their finances out before they have to file for bankruptcy. So they've extended this bankruptcy shield through the end of the year. And so companies aren't really filing for bankruptcy right now uh, in large numbers because they have the, this, um, this break from the government. Um, but once that does start to expire at the end of the year, we likely will see many companies, uh, and particularly small and medium-sized businesses in areas like hospitality, tourism, um, and, and restaurants, p businesses that have been really struggling, uh, we, we definitely could start to see more of those. One association here has estimated that about 500,000 businesses are already ex experiencing severe financial difficulties. Um, so we likely will start to see more bankruptcies next year. And that's likely also going to filter down to people having to declare uh, bankrupts bankruptcy or an insolvency. So once these businesses start to lay people off, uh, many households who have already been struggling finan financially could also uh, face bankruptcy as well. Well, thank you very much, Chelsea, for sharing your thoughts there and the update. Enjoy the rest of the day. And despite the disappointing data, Britain's FTSE 100 is, was up 125 points in the morning, meaning it's reco it recovered much of Monday's slump. Well, Juliana will tell us more. Good afternoon, Juliana. It's a bad PMI data, yet investors have reacted positively. What's driving the surprise and reaction to the news? And are equities still in the green this intraday? Well, the equities are still in the green, still flying high at intraday. Traders appear to have shrugged off the not-so-optimistic PMI data. It's not considered bad data. It's well above 50. 50, obviously, uh, being the benchmark used for expansion and contraction. And anything above 50 shows expansion. So uh, considering uh, the abysmal economic backdrop that Britain has, above 50 is still considered to be relatively good. Uh, the flash composite came in at 55.7 in September down from 59.1 in August. Uh, the public sectors that are doing particularly uh, well not so good are manufacturing and services. I think with services, a lot of economists expected that, of course, in August we had that really successful eat out to help out scheme. And, uh, you know, once people couldn't get that discount, they weren't uh, going back to the restaurant. So I think it was to be as expected. And there is a hope that consumer confidence uh, may be reignited again, but uh, who knows? We've got a lot coming around the corner in Britain, haven't we? Uh, we'll have a look at the numbers. The all-share is up 2.21%. The FTSE 100 is up by 2.38%. And the FTSE 250 is up by 1.73%. In currencies, the British pound is down against the US dollar by 0.07%, down on the euro by 0.09%, and up on the Japanese yen just uh, by 0.01%. It's worth mentioning as well, Chimaze, the sentiment uh, from yesterday's um, new restrictions um, addressed by British Prime Minister Boris Johnson. For some traders in the city, not as bad as they expected. We saw £52 billion wiped off the FTSE 100 on Monday, uh, but it seems as if uh, nerves have been calmed um, because we haven't gone into a full second lockdown. All right, let's talk a bit of um, Brexit. A Cabinet Minister Michael Gove has warned the freight industry that if they do not prepare now for Brexit, they could face queues of up to 7,000 trucks in Kent. I guess this is a tip of the iceberg of the potential disruption Brexit will cause. Well, yes and no, it's not the tip of the iceberg. This is the worst case scenario. The British government tend to do that um, with matters such as these, particularly Brexit. Of course, there are less than 100 days to go until the end of the year. So there's lots of scrambling around. And Michael Gove, the Duchy of uh, Lancaster, is responsible for a no deal Brexit doomsday. And this is exactly what this leaked document is. It is a worst case scenario issue. And uh, what um, Michael Gove is saying is that if um, 
um, these um, uh, truckers don't get their act together and sort out their paperwork, then potentially uh, there could be queues of up to 7,000 trucks uh, running for uh, two days um, outside of uh, Dover if they don't have the right restrictions. Um, this could last for up to three months. So we're seeing this last well into the spring. And of course, this has uh, created lots of reaction. Um, not happy. Uh, the, the, the haulage um, uh, associates, there is one um, gentleman who's the uh, chief of the Road Haulage Association. He says that 50,000 new staff will be needed to handle the amount of paperwork uh, that the government have given um, to the associations. They don't believe the government are doing enough. I do believe we discussed this a couple of weeks ago on this show, um, Chimazane. It was then the haulage association that was asking the government for more time, more information. They don't feel the government has done enough. But again, this is a doomsday letter. This is a, a, a letter that is uh, supposed to send shockwaves and fear. And it is the worst case scenario. So hopefully with the time uh, that is left, uh, information uh, will be processed and things will run as smoothly as possible. Though, of course, it's not going to be that smooth because no transition is as smooth as one would want it to be. But uh, Michel Barnier, the EU's chief negotiator, is due to arrive in London either tonight or tomorrow uh, for more ninth uh, further round talks uh, with his counterpart, Lord Frost, to try and secure a deal. So there is still a possibility that there could be light at the end of this Brexit tunnel. Right. Anyway, it's interesting to know that sales of toilet rolls have soared by 23% over the past week following the introduction of fresh coronavirus restrictions across most of the UK. Why toilet rolls? Um, I, I have no idea why toilet roll. I, I can presume that there are some consumers here in Britain that believe uh, toilet roll is an essential item and there are fears that uh, they will not find it on the shelves if we go into a second lockdown. Uh, but in all uh, seriousness, there has been a discussion here in this uh, country about panic buying or stockpiling. We saw it in March. Lots of people in some sort of herd uh, mentality were rushing to all of the stores uh, trying to get their hands on as much non-perishable goods as they could. And it was such a concern back then that uh, the, the big bosses of the top supermarkets did restrict how many people could buy uh, certain items and allowing uh, the elderly and those who are most vulnerable to enter stores first. Now, Dave Lewis, uh, Tesco's uh, outgoing chief exec, was speaking to the media uh, this morning and he said there is no need to panic, uh, that uh, uh, stores do have enough of a stockpile um, in their uh, coffers and that people should buy uh, you know, as as they were, as they mm. were. All right, Jelena, enjoy the rest of the day. And stocks in the Asia Pacific were mixed today as investors reacted to recent comments from Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell. Shares in Australia led gains among the region's major markets, with the SM. S&P ASS 200 in Australia jumping 2.42%. Mainland Chinese stocks were also higher on the day with the Shanghai Composite up 0.17%. The Shenzhen component added 0.665%. Hong Kong's Hansen Index was gained 0.11%. Elsewhere, South Korea's Kospi closed above the flat line. Stocks in Japan edged to lower on their first trading day of the week following holidays on Monday and Tuesday. The Nikkei 225 slipped fractionally, while the Topics Index dipped 0.13%. And U.S. stock futures were higher early today after the S&P 500 experienced its first positive day in five trading sessions. Dow futures pointed to a gain of more than 150 points. S&P 500 and Nasdaq 100 futures also implied a higher open. Better than expected earnings from Nike and KB Home lifted sentiment on Wall Street after the bell on Tuesday. On Tuesday, the major averages snapped multi-day losing and streaks all closing in the green. Powell will testify again today to Congress's select subcommittee on the coronavirus crisis. Right, we'll go on a short break and when we come back we look at the central bank's um, rate decision from an investor perspective. Do stay with us. And the Central Bank of Nigeria's Monetary Policy Committee 
in what many may describe as a surprise move cut the benchmark interest rate to 11.5% from 12.5%. This is the second cut this year and came even as inflation has been above target since 2015. Well, let's get an investment perspective to this from an investment officer at AfriInvest Securities, Robert Omotunde. Good afternoon, Robert. Thank you for joining us on the show. Thank you, Chimizi. It's my now, experience. Yeah, a lot of analysts anticipated a status quo. Did you see that move coming yesterday? Um, unfortunately, uh, most analysts expected that there was going to be, I mean, the status quo was going to be maintained. Uh, even though it was not public out there, you know, uh, we, we expected that there was going to be um, um, a, a cut in the NPR. So for me, it wasn't surprising. And to be honest with you, I think the Monetary Policy Committee, you know, is now beginning to toe the line of, you know, what we've always said, uh, in that when you look at um, policy consideration, you know, especially uh, most of the times people tend to think when, you know, you have inflationary pressure in the system, then what you should have should be NPR going up. But sometimes uh, it's not uh, that easy. In terms of monetary policy management, what the committee has done is the right thing in, in the sense that the inflationary pressure that you have right now is not induced by, you know, monetary condition. You know, this is a cost push inflationary pressure, uh, which the committee alluded to um, yesterday. And I think for me, the decision was hard. And, and I also expect that uh, in the months to come, uh, we will have uh, more uh, risk cuts just to align with market rate you know, and stimulate growth within the economy, which is the secondary objective of the central bank. Mm. Well, analysts at um, FDC described the move as a deja vu. Um, like we've, we've been there before. And of course, analysts at Nova Merchant Bank say any policy that focuses on stimulating credit growth alone without a major revamp of the structural bottlenecks in the economy will do little to provide cheaper credit to boost output. And we, of course, we had the central bank uh, governor emphasize on the need to address structural supply. What's your take on that? So what I think is that, uh, let's not forget, you know, so when I say the, the, the move to reduce the rate is hard, you know, what I'm saying in essence is that there are bottlenecks, there are structural bottlenecks, you know, to be, you know, that also affects, you know, creating credits. Uh, you could see from the CDM data, you know, say from May to date, we've seen about 4 trillion era of credit that has been created in the system. But if you dig down, you will find out that uh, it is possible that the corporates, you know, the large corporates, multinationals, account for the bulk of the credit that have been created. Now, we still have a situation where most SME businesses may still find it difficult to access credit, you know, even if the rates are much lower than they used to be about a year ago. Now, the issues are because the banks need to be comfortable with the kind of credit they want to create. So, to that extent, you know, when we say that what the MPC has done, is in the right uh, direction. What we are really saying is, think about it. If we do not have this pandemic, you know, facing us, and Nigeria's economy is not heavily dependent on oil, what we should be talking about now is stimulating growth. And look at various economies of the world. You know, major systemic central banks are focusing on stimulating growth at this time because a lot of jobs have been lost. You know, you've seen a situation where uh, economies are dipping even further than they think they could ever dip. You know, these are situations that calls for, you know, strategic uh, monetary policy action. So, which is why I said what they've done is in order. However, where I think that the central bank needs to watch is in the area of its development financing agenda. You know, because if you look at one of the comments that was raised yesterday, you know, the central bank has said they will continue to, you know, pursue growth stimulation through its development finance agenda. We need to watch it. One of the things that we need to do is to really you know, um, de-risk the environment, more or less, just so that we can still allow the, you know, normal system to help in creating those credit that we need to grow this economy. Now, how do you see investors reacting to this latest move by the central bank? Already, uh, some investors anticipated it and positioned ahead of the news. You know, uh, again, let's not forget that uh, the correlation between NPR and, you know, um, 
um, the real investment uh, to market rate in this instance is not uh, really as strong anymore, especially because people now track short term rates, treasury bills, and OMO, and then liquidity in the system to determine the direction of yield. Nonetheless, that court also signal that from the monetary policy perspective, uh, the central bank and the monetary policy committee is committed, you know, to continue to pursue a downward uh, uh, trend in the yield. So again, most investors now are, are beginning to realize that, and one of the things we're seeing now is that, which is what the market has suggested, anyways, right? Because if you look at the maturity profile of the liquidity in the system, it suggested that you are still going to see that downward yield trend. I mean, that, uh, yield trending downward up to the end of the year. So the market is already thinking in that direction. What you're likely going to see, you know, are opportunistic investors who will just play the short term. But in terms of general direction of yields, it's a, it's a downward trend. You know, again, this is the time that investors need to, you know, be more cautious in taking their position so that you don't get your fingers on. Mm. All right. Thank you very much uh, for sharing your thoughts there, Robert. Robert Pumotini is an investment officer with Afri-Invest Securities. And Zambia has become the first African country to ask bondholders for relief since the onset of the coronavirus as nations from Angola to Kenya battled to cope with the economic hit from the pandemic. The Southern African nation said it needed breathing space to plan a debt restructuring and asked holders of its three euro bonds totaling $3 billion to defer interest payments until April while it plans a restructuring of its debt. Zambia's $1 billion of notes due 2024 fell 4.5% in London to 52.46 cents on the dollar on Tuesday after the government said a coupon payment due October 14 would be included in the proposed suspension. Other countries have recently also rang alarm bells. Angola, which has negotiated debt relief with some of its lenders, told the International Monetary Fund it may have to approach a wider group of creditors if oil prices continue to decline. Care said it's at high risk of external debt distress as foreign currency obligations grow faster than revenue from abroad. And Chad asked Glencore PLC and other private creditors to delay payments on its loans until next year. And a project that aims to develop Zimbabwe's biggest platinum mine has cleared a significant hurdle with the African Export Import Bank completing a due diligence study allowing it to proceed with a $500 million syndicated funding program. While some work has started on the mine with $100 million spent to date including exploration costs, a significant amount of investment will now be needed if Great Dyke Investment owned by Russia's VI Holding and Zimbabwean Investment investors is to complete the $2 billion project. The project funding structure envisages participation of various types of equity investors as well as lenders. Still, the country is struggling to attract foreign investment. It's unable to pay its debt to multilateral organizations such as the World Bank and has been criticized by potential lenders for its poor economic management and human rights abuses. And on global oil market, prices fell in early trade after an industry group reported a surprise rise in U.S. crude, adding to worries about demand that led to a steep sell-off earlier in the week. Brent crude was trading down 30 cents at $41.42 a barrel after gaining 28 cents on Tuesday, while U.S. crude dropped 34 cents to $39.46. Both contracts fell more than 4% on Monday, the most in two weeks. And that's a wrap on the program. Thank you for watching. I'm Chimeze Obi Iwago.